Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Plant Healthcare PLC H1 Trading Statement Investor Presentation. Throughout this presentation, attendees will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted anytime via the Q&A tab situated in the right-hand corner of your screen. Simply click Q&A, type in your question, and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and publish responses where appropriate to do so. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll notify you once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you this presentation is being recorded. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll. And I'd like to hand you over to Chris Richard, CEO, Jeff Hovey, CFO, and Jeff Tweedy, COO of Plant Healthcare PLC. Good afternoon. Thank you, Paul, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon to present our first half uh, trading statement. Uh, my name is Chris Richards. I'm CEO of Plant Healthcare. And joining us from Raleigh, North Carolina today are Jeff Hovey, CFO, and Jeff Tweedy, COO, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, guys. Uh, Jeff Hovey, CFO. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I've been with Plant Healthcare since September of 2013. Prior to that, I was with a regional office supply company based in the southeastern portion of the United States and led the effort to sell that company to Staples in, in the middle of 2013. Good afternoon, Jeff Tweedy, COO. I've been with Plant Healthcare uh, coming up on four years now. I've got about 30 years experience in the industry working with companies, uh, Syngenta Legacy, uh, Syngenta Organizations, and uh, Arista Life Science. So looking forward to the meeting today. Thank you, guys. Uh, now I'm going to kick this off if I move to our first substantive slide, just as a reminder of who we are, Plant Healthcare. Plant Healthcare, we are at the center of the movement towards sustainable agriculture. And I'm really proud of the fact that uh, a month or so ago, uh, our sustainability credentials were confirmed by the LSE uh, and achieving the LSE's green economy mark uh, is a very important stamp of our environmental sustainability uh, position. So it's not just us saying we're sustainable, uh, we're certified now by the, by the LSE. No, so agriculture is becoming more sustainable and that's driving the demand for biological solutions at more than 16% per annum. Um, our belief is that agriculture is going to become much more sustainable, but we're not focusing only on organic agriculture, which represents less than 2% of global agriculture. Our mission is to make conventional agriculture, the 98%, uh, more sustainable. So we'd like you to think about this company in two buckets. The first of all, our, our existing commercial business where our pillar product uh, is Harpin Alpha Beta, uh, which is now proven in a number of markets. And Jeff Tweedy will tell you how that's going and how that went in the first half of this year. It, this product offers great benefits to farmers uh, is, is, and growth is accelerating in major markets and it generates a good gross margin, a 70% gross margin from Harpin uh, Alpha Beta. On our commercial business um, in the year 2020, and we anticipate the same in 21, was both EBITDA positive and cash generative. As a company, however, we're also investing significantly in our new technology, Pretech, which we call Vaccines for Plants. And we'll tell you more about that later. And remember, what these uh, products do is they touch the plant and they switch on the immune system of the plant. They make the plant healthier and that allows the plant to resist disease, to resist drought uh, and ends up with providing more yield to farmers. Um, so we don't kill anything in plant healthcare. We're just making plants able to defend themselves better uh, and, and produce more. We've invested more than $20 million uh, in vaccines for plants, our pretech, uh, over the last eight years, and we're targeting very, very large markets with a value of more than five billion dollars. And our first launch in Brazil is planned for later in this year. And Jeff Hovey, uh, Jeff Tweedy, rather, will, will take you through that uh, in in a minute. So I'm without hogging the limelight uh, of the financials, which Jeff Hovey will take you through in a minute. Um, our trading statement, which we re we reported this morning to the market, um, showed robust 
trading in the first half with revenue up 13% to $3.5 million, reduced cash burn to $1.5 million, uh, and we have cash reserves of $11 million, which we are determined will take us through to cash positive. On the commercial side, Harpin Alpha Beta, our core 70% gross margin product, grew at 26%. Uh, and Jeff Tweedy will take you through a very encouraging in-market sales growth in the USA and strong growth also in, in Europe. We, on the other hand, uh, had a, a less exciting growth in Brazil and in Mexico, where we had issues of drought uh, and also COVID-19 is um, making it more difficult to uh, promote the use of these products um, uh, by, by making it hard for our technical guys to make promotional visits to growers. In terms of pre-tech, we're very excited about the launch of Saori, our novel product, our very first pre-tech launch coming up in Brazil in the next few weeks. The USA is progressing to launches next year and the year after, and we're making important progress uh, with toll manufacturing. So we are on track to deliver the expectations and plans that we shared with the market at the time of our fundraise uh, in March. That said, I'll pass to uh, Jeff Tweedy now to take you through the highlights of the commercial performance in the first half. Jeff. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon. I really want to start by uh, we've got a tremendous uh, in market growth of uh, growth of Harpin with our customers this year. As Chris said, our year to date on ground sales with customers is 25 percent higher than all of last year. Uh, and that's a real metric that we started tracking a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and that's great news for us. Uh, that demonstrates the strong uh, adoption by Harpin. Uh, and acceptance by our customers. Consumption of our Harpin Alpha Beta and corn was up 20% driven by uh, good performance. And our, our product in corn with our partner there is approaching 1% share. Uh, and this is, it was a difficult spring in corn. And what growers saw was taller corn, much stronger, and that what they believe will be uh, greater yields uh, at the end of the season. In our specialty market, I'm happy to say that our sales doubled from 2020 in our in market, and this is a year-to-date number so far. The season is still under, still going on up in the Pacific Northwest, and it's really the success of our team working with such a partner, a strong partner in Wilbur Ellis, and uh, reinforces the commitment to partnering with these large distributors who can create demand for this technology and partnering with a partner like uh, Plant Healthcare. We believe these two combined markets are worth uh, $15 million worth of sales, XPHC, in the coming years. Uh, and as this growth demonstrates, um, we're headed that direction, which I'm very proud of. If we move to the next slide, uh, I want to begin by the great success in Europe um, this half. Uh, as we know, as we've mentioned in the past, Europe is the largest biologicals market in the world. Our sales were up 69%, and that was driven mainly by uh, sales into citrus in Spain, Portugal. Uh, Harpin sales nearly doubled our 2021 on ground in, uh, in the UK. And then we had a return of the amenity market post COVID. So uh, we're back treating uh, football fields and professional golf field uh, turf uh, in this market, which is good. So the the, the team has done a great job within our European market uh, to uh, grow the Harpen business uh, this year. We can send, continue to see great performance from Harpen app, applications and sugarcane. If you look to the right, um, this is a picture of sugarcane to the right treated with uh, Harpen, and then the left side is non-treated. This is from this past, I uh, uh, guess it would be the winter in Brazil. They've had extreme drought. And so even under these extreme conditions, uh, we still continue to see good performance from the Harpen Alpha Beta and sugarcane. Our half one sales were affected by that drought along with COVID and the inability to see customers. Uh, and so that limited the, our, our first half sales there. Also in Mexico, as Chris mentioned, we've COVID continues to be an issue. Our first half sales in Mexico were slightly lower than 2020. And we've also seen an impact of 
pricing, commodity pricing, and the fruit and vegetable market, which limited those sales. We did have some impact on our gross margin, and that was really to uh, our overall gross margin. That was due to volatility, currency volatility in Mexico. If you look to the right, just to finish off, there's a chart here where we track our Harpin sales and sugarcane. What I'd like to reference is this regression line. And even though it's been a challenging year, we still see uh, continued growth and, and expectations of growth on a full year basis, which gives us confidence that these sales will return to more historical trends uh, once we move through these COVID issues and also um, uh, the drought conditions that are plaguing uh, the Brazilian market right now. And it will start to normalize. I want to turn now to uh, Seori and, and what Chris mentioned, our launch of our first pre-tech uh, technology. Um, it will be launched later this year in soybeans for Asian rust control. And what we've seen this past year, and I'll touch on it in a minute, but we've seen really uh, more vigorous plants with less disease from this seed treatment. Uh, and this is the first of its kind for Asian soybean uh, rust control. This is one of the world's largest markets. Growers spend over $2.5 billion each year on fungicides. So it's a great opportunity to really introduce a disruptive technology and a new tool for a grower uh, in this in the soybean market. When we look at the positioning of this, the really underlying position that we're going to take is Sori is looking after your soy crop when you're not there. And what we see is it protects the plants against diseases, uh, not only Asian soy rust, but we uh, tested on new diseases this year earlier in the season. And we'll be adding those to the label as we go through the regulatory process. So that was uh, very positive from this year's results. You maintain a healthier crop. It's a sustainable green type of product that reduces the need for other agrochemicals. Um, and you see significant yield increase with a strong return on investment. This is our fourth year of testing, and, we've, and we continue to see the yield increase, even when there's lower pressures of disease there, uh, which we find uh, encouraging uh, for, as, a, as a benefit for the grower. Our launch planning, as we look at that, we had uh, a really strong endorsement from 16 technical advisors. We had over 34 trials out this past year. Um, and they were they had uh, raving comments about this product. They've uh, extremely pro uh, positive. They've seen strong interest in this. They believe that the growers uh, will be uh, welcoming a new tool to fight Asian soy rust. So I think that's really encouraging. Uh, we also did some market research around that, looking at the impact and what grow what they think of this. We've got some strong data back on that. Um, we will have a small scale launch and this launch really we want to work with early adopters. So growers haven't tested this product in the past. So we want to get it in the hands of a lot of growers, small uh, hectares treated and really build awareness for this uh, in 2022. Um, and that will begin. We kicked off a product awareness campaign last week. Um, we had almost 2000 people attend a virtual type of uh, launch. And we've also started hiring field staff uh, to work in the field to start to position the product and work with seed treaters. Our plan is sales through uh, what we call seed multipliers. So they are, uh, have access to almost 5,000 hectares of soybeans working with these seed multipliers. And there is a potential we could have uh, a single national partner. Um, we have a number of discussions going on there. Uh, as we move forward. But our plans are to be in this market and begin those applications uh, in October when the season happens. Lastly, I just want to talk about our pre-tech launch plans for the U.S. We've been working very closely with our partner, Wilbur Ellis, on field trials this year. In the early season, we're seeing uh, very uh, good results on disease control with PHC 279, uh, and that's really targeted at potatoes. There'll be other crops that we'll add later, but that's uh, early season results. Our plan is to do a soft launch in uh, Q4 of 2022 when the regular registration is approved, approved uh, assuming that they come in uh, as planned. Wilbur Ellis has also got a very significant program with PHC 949. This is our uh, a peptide for nematode control. And, and I can tell you, they, those, that data looks really good. 
Um, it looks as good as the chemical standards that are out there today. And I think they were quite excited about those results. Um, we are planning to submit a registration in Q4 of 2022 um, with an expected launch in Q, uh, Q4 of 2023. We've also initiated field trials with PHC 404. This is a biostimulant product and uh, a newer one that we're bringing forward. And we expect to have results later this year. I like this market because we, the registration timelines are uh, not as long. Um, and this could be a new opportunity um, that, that we can bring forward as far as building out a, a portfolio of peptides that we launch in the different markets. So in summary, I just want to say that, you know, we've really built a foundation with Harpin and this commercial business. Um, and this really gives us a footprint as we progress uh, with the peptide, uh, the pre-tech platform with customers and partners. Um, and now you can see we're starting to really develop out a pipeline of new products and bring launches over the next two to three years, uh, which is really exciting for the commercial business. And with that, I will turn it over to Jeff Hubby. Okay. Thank you, Jeff. Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'll be walking you through revenue, uh, expenses, and a couple of uh, items on the balance sheet. So let's start with revenue. As Chris mentioned, our first half revenue was 3.5 million, which was an increase of 13% over prior year. Um, this uh, increase was led by the EMEA region, which we define as Spain and the UK, which grew around 76%. Harbin revenue increased 26% year over year to 2.4 million. All regions with the exception of Brazil experienced growth. Uh, the EMEA region was up 83%. And although overall Mexico sales decreased 3%, Harpen sales in this region actually grew 24%. Uh, our gross margin decreased 3% to 56%, uh, mainly due to the currency effects that we experienced in our Mex Mexican subsidiary. Our cash operating expenses increased uh, in order to drive commercial sales globally, and then the launch of our pre-tech pre product launches. Um, Cash used in operations um, decreased 600,000 to 1.5 million. Um, this is mainly due to improvements in working capital, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, the increase in, in the adjusted EBITDA to 2.3 uh, was due to the increase of cash operating expenses, which I just mentioned, offset by uh, the gross margin. Uh, the operating loss at the very bottom of that chart uh, dropped significantly versus the same period of last year. Uh, that's because we experienced a transitional, translational gain in the first half. Transitional gains and losses are uh, non-cash expenses, and the uh, it's the expenses or gains or losses are driven by movements in the pound associated with our intercompany swelling loans. And finally, looking at the bottom right chart uh, between the first half of 2019 and first half of 2021. Uh, Harpen experienced a kegger of 35%. Uh, this is due to increased sales in the Americas, which we define as North and South America, mainly Brazil and the EMEA region. Both these regions uh, experienced growth of at least 40% in this time period. Uh, moving to the balance sheets, uh, focus on inventory. Inventory decreased 500,000 from the year end. Um, the management team continues to emphasize reducing our inventory reducing our inventory position, and we look for this trend to continue through the end of the year. Uh, the receivables decreased 600,000 from year to 2.4 million. Due to the uh, seasonality of our revenue, which is weighted towards the second half of the year, our collections are typically higher in the first quarter of the year. Just to give you an idea of the sales cycle, typically 40% of our overall sales are in the first half with 60% weighted in, in the second half. Um, the, the payable amount, which is lumped into the payables and accrued expenses, decreased 500,000 due to the payment that we made to our Harpin supplier in the first quarter. So working capital improved 400,000 or 7% from year end. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we've seen significant progress in, in reducing our working capital over the last 18 months. And during this time frame, uh, we've managed to reduce our working capital by approximately $1 million. Um, the borrowings amount of one point 
one million uh, is the effects of uh, IFRS 16, which requires us to put all leases on the balance sheet. Uh, if you exclude yeah, the effects of IFRS 16, our debt is is a modest 150,000. Uh, we successfully raised nine, $9.1 million net of cost as part of the March 2021 a fundraise, and as Chris mentioned in his presentation, our cash and cash equivalents as of June 30th was 11.1 million. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so coming back to the, the last two slides we have, I just wanted to make a, a quick comment about the strength of the management team uh, in plant healthcare, um, as well as the uh gentlemen you have in front of us in front of you today we have dr jean min Wei, our chief science officer who is the original inventor of harpin alpha beta um, and also of of pretech and leads our, our our research um and mark turner uh who's in charge of corporate and business development but i particularly wanted to pick out dr patrick doyle uh who joined us uh, uh, a month or so ago um, following the equity raise, we decided to strengthen the, uh, the management team uh, by hiring a really, really experienced product development and regulatory lead. And Patrick uh, comes to us with an absolutely blue chip experience, both in Syngenta and in uh, a biologicals company. Uh, and he will be leading the charge in ensuring that we bring our pre-tech products, our vaccines for plants, to launch our on schedule over the next uh, uh, year, two years, and three years, and four years. And finally then, what are the milestones against which uh, we would like you to judge us in the future? First of all, on the commercial side, uh, we plan to deliver continued product adoption in our core markets. We plan to drive revenue in Europe, uh, including signing up a major new distributor this year. Uh, and as a result of those efforts, we will deliver revenue growth above the sector average of 16% per annum. And that will ensure that our commercial business is consistently profitable and cash generative. On the pretech side, uh, as Jeff Tweedy has pointed out, we'll launch Saori in Brazil um, in the next few weeks. Uh, we will submit PHC 949 to the EPA for US registration later this year. Next year, we expect to achieve the registration of PHC 279 uh, in the US. And we'll continue to work with Wilbur Ellis on the joint development agreement while pursuing further joint development agreements. Um, we will appoint a toll manufacturer for PHC 279 this year, and we will work to strengthen our IP and formulation development uh, in our Seattle uh, laboratories, while at the same time, one of the tasks for Patrick Doyle is to commence pre-tech development uh, in the really critical European market. So finally, on the group side, we are tracking to group cash positive within our cash reserves, uh, and we will explore opportunities from consolidation in the sector. And I hope that we will be able to uh, share results from that initiative with investors uh, over the coming months. So that being said, Paul, those are the slides we plan to present. I'll hand back to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Chris. And thank you to Jeff and Jeff as well. And um, ladies and gentlemen, do please continue to submit your questions just using the Q&A tab situated on the top right hand corner of your screen. But just while the company take a few moments to review those investor questions submitted already, I'd like to remind you that a recording the presentation along with a copy of the slides and the published Q&A can be accessed from your Investor Meet Company dashboard um, and you'll be notified once they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that your feedback is important to the company and immediately after the presentation has ended, you will be redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order the company can better understand your views and expectations. Um, we have had a number of questions submitted during the presentation today and perhaps Chris, if I may, if I could hand back to you just to read out the question where appropriate to do so and either give your response or direct it to, to the team. Sure, thanks, thanks Paul. So uh, we've had some really great questions which we look forward to answering. Um, the first one I'm gonna, gonna take is from Andrew C. 
Do you think it's possible you could get market share beyond the indicated 5% in some markets? Um, well, I'm going to give you an answer to that, but I'm then going to pass to Jeff Tweedy, whose job it is to do it. I, I, <laughs> quick answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we can. Um, in corn, we are approaching 1% market share now in, in the US. And I think we could get beyond 5% in, in that and potentially other markets. The reason we set 5% uh, in, in US corn uh, is because, frankly, where we were two years ago, I don't think anyone would have believed us if we'd said we'd get to a higher number. So we were deliberately modest. Jeff, how would you put that? I would agree with that, Chris. And what I would add is that the way you get there is you have to have partners like these large distributors and the strategy that we've taken forward. If you look at other biological companies in this space and how they've entered the market, they've worked with very uh, small, local, regionalized distributors. And it takes several of them to, to achieve just enough acres available to get there. Uh, the partner that we have today has access to almost 30% of the corn acres. So I think it's, I, I don't think it's unreasonable in the way that their products are distributed through their proprietary brands. That would not be, uh, that would not be unusual at all. And so that's why we've taken the strategy of signing up the customers that we have, the distribution strategy, and we want to continue that in other parts of the world, uh, partnering with large distributors who bring us market access. Th thanks, Jeff. Um, next question I'm going to pick up is from Andy M, which is a, a little bit along the same lines. How big do you see the Brazilian market opportunity and has the current climate changed this? And I'm going to pass this to Jeff. And I guess, Jeff, um, you could cover both um, our, our uh, Harpin sales in sugarcane and also maybe talk about Saori uh, and perhaps mention that we've got other products in, in the pipeline in Brazil. Yep. Yeah, it's a great question. You know, we see this as a great opportunity. The return on investment for a grower has, and the results that we've seen with Harpen on sugarcane has, has been great. Yields increase of uh, 23%. If we were to get a 10% uh, a share of this market, we believe it's a $15 million opportunity. Um, I believe the drought has impacted some of that and as long as COVID on our progression to get there. But uh, we ended last year with almost a 1% share just in Sao Paulo State alone. So I think, you know, we were on a, a very good trend and that will continue. Um, so uh, we definitely see that that's achievable. On Sori, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity for this product because it's the first of its kind that actually provides control of Asian soy rust and, and also will get other diseases as a seed treatment. All these fungicides go on, you know, as as the disease is happening throughout the season. We're already on the we'll be on the seed before the disease even enters the field. And I think that's what makes it more of a disruptive technology. And that's where we, we want to get a, several growers this year exposed to the product. If we were to go out and we only and five growers treated, you know, 50 percent of their hectares, to me, that would be a failure. We need to look at multiple growers, smaller hectares, have them test the product and, and, and work with early adopters to really get that momentum going for, for seasons 22 and 23 and beyond. And I think beyond that, with uh, PHC 949 as a nematocyte, we've got some really strong interest in that. We have not done a lot of testing in Brazil, but we'll begin that this year. We just received our RET for testing which is required, and, but we do have a number of partners that we're talking to as a potential uh, use for this. And we have to remember that nematocyte, nematodes in soybeans and all crops is a real problem. And a lot of chemistries are leaving the market because of regulatory issues. So it's a great fit that we've got a, a biological product that's per showing performance as good as the traditional chemicals. So I think shares of, of those levels are very achievable in the Brazilian market. Thanks, Jeff. I would also add that I, with Saori, we do expect to be selling double digit millions of, of dollars in a few years time, four or five years time. Um, and I think Brazil will be a very, very important market for us, which is also, by the way, uh, why Jeff Harvey has been very involved down in Brazil 
ensuring that we have factoring in place so that we collect money um, in a, a timely fashion uh, in Brazil. So we're very conscious not just of selling in Brazil, uh, but also of collecting and, and getting the money back into our, our tills in, in the US. Um, and building on that, Andy Airmas question, how big do you see the Brazilian market? Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. I, I, we've just done that question. So I, I actually intended to go on to the Mexican question. Uh, Andrew C says, can you say a little about why export prices to Mexico were low? Uh, were low? And I, I will take that one. Um, we, we do a high proportion of our sales in Mexico to uh, very high technology, very sophisticated producers of vegetables who export to the US. Um, and that business tends to be affected very much uh, by the prices uh, at which they can export those vegetables, um, which in turn depends upon how well the season's going in the US. And in this last uh, growing season, unfortunately, prices were rather low. The export prices of fruits, of vegetables, from Mexico to the US were low, uh, and that means that um, the users bought less product uh, from us. So that was the uh, the reason there. But I wanna move on to a question from Simon C here, uh, uh, which is definitely another one for Mr. Tweedy here. Uh, how are you selling to clients in Europe? And how big is the market opportunity for your products? Do you expect to continue the same growth trajectory um, of 76%, which we had in the first half of this year. Hey, Jeff, there's a there's a challenge for you. How do you answer that one? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, as, as we mentioned, the, the European market is the largest margin for biologicals. Um, and we see it as a, uh, as a tremendous opportunity. I think we've been working with a large distributor, um, uh, which we would want to add to our portfolio of, of exclusive agreements. I think that will help with the trajectory. I think the uh, the other thing that will uh, help us is we've now got Patrick Doyle working with us on a regulatory strategy. Today, uh, we're limited in, in some of the European countries we can't sell because of lack of registration. And so we're putting in a plan today to really expand that from where we are, uh, not only in Spain, Portugal, uh, but we would like to get into countries like Poland, we want to get into France. We want to get into Germany. So I think as those registrations come, yes, we'll see those kind of growth rates. It'll take us a year or so to get there. Um, and remember in the UK, I mentioned we were just getting started in uh, on potatoes. And we've seen uh, sales double again this year on potatoes. So we're very. that's a large market. Uh, if you look at the shares, it's pretty small today compared to where it could be. And we would like that double digit growth to continue in those markets that we're in um, and then expand to registrations. Thanks, thanks, Jeff. Um, there's another question coming on Brazil, uh, which I'm gonna to toss back to you, Jeff Tweedy, uh, from Josh M. Uh, if harpin sales are being impacted in Brazil by COVID-19, should we expect no sales for Saori in Brazil in 2022? I'm looking forward to hearing your answer to that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think the answer to that would be uh, no, we do expect sales. Uh, we do have a limited launch that we're going to do this year. I think it's very modest uh, compared to uh, the opportunity. Um, you have to remember that this Asian soy rust is a huge problem in Brazil. Growers are looking for different types of solutions. They're, you know, they modified uh, when they plant types of uh, soybean varieties they plant. So there's a lot of things they're looking to avoid or, or limit the impact. Uh, it's, it's a very easy treatment for them. You put it on at the beginning of the season. We've had a number of conversations already with these seed multipliers. Um, and so right now we're answering a technical questions about how to apply it to the seed, but there's strong interest. So will there be no sales? No, we will have sales. Uh, and the data that we've received this year from our advisors has been very positive. And we've been promoting that out to the field to really build the awareness. Thanks, Jeff. Um, now, there's a couple of questions here, which I think uh, fit for, for Jeff Harvey here, really. Um, the first one from Josh M. Grateful if you could go into more detail on the gross margin, three points contraction. 
Which currencies in particular impacted and were there any other factors? Well, actually, I'll talk about the currencies that we currently have. We're, we, we have reals, euros, pesos. And in this particular case, uh, all those currencies, with the exception of the peso, pretty much rebounded uh, during 2020 from the pandemic. The peso was a little bit behind. It didn't recover until its last part of 2020. So we're still feeling the effects of that in the first half. However, uh, we expect in the second half that re that the margin to rebound to levels similar to what we've had, if not even a little bit higher um, than we've had in the past. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and there's another one for you, I think, here from Andrew C. There was a recent comment in the full year report about a cost increase in Harpin because of US tariffs with China. Could you expand on this, please? Is it because PHC has some product manufactured in China? I'll start off with that and then I'll, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff as well. Um, yes, the answer is yes. We still uh, import product, Harpin in particular, from China. Uh, yes, there was a price increase from the tariffs. Uh, but we are working uh, to minimize that exposure. Come. Yeah, I mean, one of the things, it's a great question. Uh, one of the things we did last year is we brought material in to Europe and uh, we, we consumed it there because our inventories were enough in the U.S. to cover our U.S. and Brazilian business. So we were able to avoid some of that impact. Um, and our plans is that we will bring in material sometime at the end of this year or first quarter of next year. Um, and the hope is, is that they can, by that time, uh, the tariff will have worked itself out. Uh, but in light of that, we are having discussions with customers now about potential price increases uh, beginning in 2022. Thanks, guys. Um Another question here for, for Jeff Harvey from David D. Do, does PHC hedge to minimize foreign exchange exposure risks? That's a great question. Uh, we've looked into this several times, uh, multiple companies, and we've come to the conclusion that uh, we could hedge, but it's, it's too cost uh, prohibitive. Uh, we looked at it from multiple different angles, multiple different co uh, companies, and it, it was just too it was too costly to make it worthwhile. Um, thank you for that. Um, the, uh, there are a couple of really nice questions here. Um, Alan H, is there a particular reason why your focus appears to be the US and South America and not Asia? I think I'm going to answer that one. And Jeff Tweedy, you can jump in if you disagree. I, I think the main reason is that we're a small company and you can't do everything at once. Uh, you have to focus. Um, and we uh, have been working in the US. We're a US-based company. We've been working in the US for some years. We know how the products work in, in US crops. Um, and then we were lucky enough to, uh, to find really good uses for um, Harpin Alpha Beta in Brazil sugarcane. And then Brazil is just such a huge uh, market for agriculture. The U.S. and Brazil are the two largest markets for agriculture in the, in the world. We will get to Asia in due course. There are some really interesting markets in Asia. But frankly, with a small team, uh, we, we have to start somewhere. Uh, and we have to generate profitable sales where we can. And then we will, we will globalize when we've got the financial resources to do it. Jeff Tweedy, would you answer that differently? No, I don't think I would add, Chris, is that if you look at our distribution strategy that we've laid out the last, uh, you know, we've partnered with large distributors. Those markets are very fragmented. And so for us to enter those markets, we would need uh, a single partner or maybe type of a licensing. So another company that's established there. Uh, we do have uh, relationships with companies that are doing some testing in those markets today. Uh, so, for example, sugarcane in India would be of interest. We're doing some testing there with them. Um, and, and that's how we would enter those markets. I don't see us setting up a separate subsidiary and a sales force there. We would look to partner just because it is so fragmented. So more of a cost effective way to get in. Uh, but they are our opportunities and potentially we could get in in the, in the very near future. 
Thanks, Jeff. And the final question I'm going to pick up because of, of time, really, uh, is from Benjamin C. Uh, Hi, Chris and team. Good progress so far. Could you give some more color on the new significant partner in Europe? And is this partner trialing pre-tech? I'm, I'm going to pick up that one because this is our last question. And Jeff Tweedy has otherwise done all the work. So um, this is a great distributor. Jeff Tweedy has set out the strategy which he has been implementing for the last three years of partnering with very strong distributors. So this is a, a, a market leader uh, in a significant European country. I, I don't want to say any more until it's announced, uh, but it, I hope it will be announced pretty soon. And yes, uh, they are doing work on pre-tech. Uh, and they have really, really good uh, facilities for trialing these products. Um, and uh, I, I'm excited about working with that, that partner as we uh, go forward. So, uh, Paul, then back to you. I think uh, those are yeah, the questions. Th 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 thank you uh, indeed, Chris. Thanks, Jeff and Jeff as well. You, you've covered off all those questions. And of course, any further questions that do come through, the company review all questions submitted today and we'll publish those responses where appropriate to do so on the Investor Meet Company platform. Um, Chris, perhaps I could just ask you just for a final few words just before we redirect the uh, investors to give you some feedback, please. Sure, absolutely. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for listening. In plant healthcare, our tails are up. We're feeling really good uh, about the way that Harp and Alpha Beta sales are growing in our priority markets. Sales are accelerating in exactly the way that we anticipated they would. Um, and we are also making really good progress with our new pre-tech vaccines for plants. It takes time in agriculture to get everything right. Uh, but we believe that the work we've done over the last few years positions us really, really well. And finally, we're looking forward with confidence uh, to the second half. Uh, and we, we fully anticipate at least achieving market expectations for uh, the first year, for the full year. So thank you for your time uh, today. Uh, and we look forward to talking to you uh, in the future. Thank you, Paul. That's fantastic. Thank you again uh, to you all for updating investors today. Can I please ask investors not to close the session? You should be automatically redirected for the opportunity to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete and is greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Plant Healthcare PLC, we'd like to thank you very much for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session. Thank you. And good afternoon.